used to be. You may be right. A provocative new study published in Intelligence magazine suggests human intelligence has been on the decline since the Victorian era. Can that be true? How do you measure smarts anyway, or compare them across eras and cultures? Could your cranky old grandpa be right about kids these days? Joining us to discuss is Jack Mayer, professor of psychology at the University of New Hampshire, and one of the authors of the intelligence study itself, Dr. Jan Tenoinhoes from the Faculty of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Amsterdam. Jan, uh, forgive me if I don't refer to you every single time as Dr. Tenoinhoes. Uh, my decidedly undutch tongue will sooner or later mutilate it, I guarantee, I guarantee that. But just explain your study to us. What did you do and what did you find? Uh, well, we looked at old measures of uh, simple reaction time. We started in the 1880s, so old studies from Francis Galton. And then we looked at old studies that were comparable to the old Galton studies. So we found 16 of them, uh, so going from 1903 to 2004. And then we simply looked at the reaction time, and reaction time has been incredibly slowing down. It's a really strong effect. Then what we did, we uh, computed uh, we translated the decline in reaction time uh, into uh, IQ scores. So we have a decline of nothing less than 14 IQ points in 120 years. That's a very big decline. Who was doing tests of reaction time in the Victorian era? Uh, Francis Galton. He was uh, one of the brilliant, most brilliant people that ever walked the planet Earth. He was a cousin of Francis Galton. Uh, so, uh, uh, Charles Darwin. Yes. Uh, Charles Darwin. Sorry, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Very brilliant family there. So uh, one of the most brilliant people of the 19th century was experimenting with reaction time measures. And basically, you just show someone a stimulus uh, and then you, you'd see how long it takes them to hit a button when they see a light go off or something like that, right? Why is that, why, why is that a yardstick of intelligence rather than just reflex time? Uh, well, it, it has been shown to be quite substantially correlated with scores on the classical IQ test. So we show that actually it's such a good measure of intelligence that you could very nicely put it into a classical IQ test. That's very comparable to, you know, test of uh, numbers or test of word knowledge or something like that. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a quite good measure of intelligence. So actually, if, your right. So if, if this test is a good proxy for IQ, why do you have a hypothesis about why IQs would be going down over the centuries? Uh, well, IQs have been going up over the centuries, but IQ scores, but intelligence has been going down if you measure intelligence using reaction time measures. But <laughs> right, but us, that, that sort of gets to the crux of the, of the question, doesn't it? If IQs are going up, but we say that reflex times are going down, which is the actual closer, uh, which is the better yardstick of intelligence? Uh, well, I would say that the reaction time measures are better to, co to compare people over generations. Uh, so, suppose you take an intelligence test, uh, well, we, uh, the whole population of Dutch males that, uh, that had to go to the military service were tested in 1950. Uh, and the same test was given to the military uh, people for military service in 1980. So the scores went up with 21 IQ points. And then, uh, if you would, uh, then the scores went up even after that. So if you take the IQ test of 1950 in the Netherlands, now we, we would have an IQ score of 135. This would mean that 60% of the Dutch population would consist of geniuses. And so 99% of the Nobel Prizes would go to us. All, uh, all, everybody in the world would be studying Dutch. And this is definitely not happening. So I think the people in 1950 are as clever as the people in 2013. So it's, the IQ test is a really bad measure for comparing people from different generations. Professor Mayer, what do you think a good test is? I mean, what is it that we're trying to measure when we measure intelligence and how best should we do it? Well, I, I think uh, if I, I don't know if you can see this diagram, but I often think of uh, well, let me let me start with just a description. I, a one widely accepted view of intelligence today. Can you see me, by the way, because I blocked out on my screen? Yeah, you're, you're fine. Although you are looking a little bit to the right, so you, if you can look directly okay. at your webcam, there you go. That looks more sure, natural. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, sure. Um, so we uh, uh, one one uh, widely accepted view of intelligence today looks at it as uh, uh, across three different levels. Uh, now, the levels are not different in importance. They're all important and they're all part of intelligence. At the top level is a general intelligence. And then there are somewhere between eight and 14 broad intelligences at the second level or the second stratum, as it's sometimes called. And then there are 70 plus uh, specific abilities 
uh, further down on the on the third stratum. So intelligence is a combination of these three. Uh, intelligence occupies all three of these levels. I don't think one is a better level than another, although some levels are better for certain problems uh, than others. For example, if you're trying to diagnose a, a, a student who's having learning troubles, you may want to look at specific skills. If you're in a clinical practice and you're trying to figure out how somebody's having uh, living, living problems, you might look at the broad levels. And if you're doing uh, research broadly on uh, human behavior, uh, you might look at the general level. And what do you make, yeah, what do you make of uh, Jan's uh, study? Well, I, I think it's, uh, it, it's interesting to look at reaction time. I, I tend to regard reaction time as a, uh, a bit of a smaller part of intelligence maybe than uh, Jan does. Um, I was going to show you this diagram before. It's, uh, this is my, uh, these are my three levels here with uh, general intelligence. And in this model, which is known sometimes referred to as the Carroll model or the uh, Cattell Horn Carroll model, uh, w one of these broad intelligence is speededness. But the rest involve a number of very interesting uh, mental abilities that range from the traditional things you think of as intelligence, like verbal intelligence and uh, spatial intelligence, to a group of new intelligences that my colleagues and I are looking at, such as personal intelligence and emotional intelligence. And as I say, uh, speededness is one of those broad areas as well. How do, how do you measure things like emotional intelligence? Well, people uh, measure it in a variety of different ways, uh, but I think the only good way to, uh, 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 to, uh, to measure it is probably to use abil uh, ability measurement. I shouldn't say probably. The only way that I know of to accurately measure it is to ask people to solve problems and then look at their answers against a criterion of correctness, which we call ability measurement or performance measurement. But was, I'm sorry, I'm unclear about how you can establish someone's emotional intelligence. That just sounds like an IQ test to me. You, you start out where you give people questions, you see right. whether or not their answers correlate to the correct answers. But how do you know what the correct answers are in the field of emotional intelligence? Well, that's a very good question. And in fact, uh, it's something that has uh, been controversial in the work that my colleagues and I have been doing. We started out by looking at consensus criteria. That is, we looked at what most people believe to be the correct answer to a problem. Let me give you an example of a problem um, so you can see what we're talking about. Um, let's say uh, Jane were uh, angry and then an hour later uh, she was ashamed. What might have happened in between her anger to lead to her shame? Well, one answer might be uh, she discovered that she unjustly accused somebody of doing something to her, that she felt guilty about it. Um, as it turns out, uh, if you ask this across a number of people, most people agree that's a good answer. Whereas if you ask people something like, uh, or rather if you, if you give people an alternative such as uh, she got, uh, she went out for an ice cream cone in between, well, that just doesn't follow. So people will identify that as a bad answer. So that's how we started. But nowadays we use experts, emotion experts, to decide what's a good answer. And indeed, we're moving to what's referred to as veridical scoring, where we uh, have experts sit together in a room and, and decide on the correct answer. Jan, it's interesting to when you start factoring in emotional intelligence into these sorts of calculations, because I think we all know people who are technically geniuses or who are highly, highly intelligent, but have terrible interpersonal skills. Uh, that presumably doesn't factor into the test, the study that you were doing. No, we did not use uh, emotional intelligence test, but I'm a big fan of uh, Professor Meyer's work Actually, uh, the example he just used, I also use in my own lectures at the University of Amsterdam. And it, it strikes me that the correct answers here are a little bit different from other forms of intelligence, because as Professor Meyer was just saying, it's, it's based essentially on a consensus. I mean, at least the starting point is that most people will come up with a good answer to, to, what, to what is an indicator of good emotional intelligence and what is an indicator of bad emotional intelligence. Whereas on an IQ test, for example, uh, we're not relying on the consensus of other people to establish which answers are, answers are correct or false. Yes, that, that's the case. But uh, uh, you, you see very high correlations between scores and emotional intelligence and the more classical IQ measures, eh? like verbal or numbers or uh, spatial rotation. So I would say that the emotional intelligence fits in very nicely with the classical intelligence model that uh, Professor Meyer was describing in his picture. 
Right, uh, Professor Meyer, let's let's just get back to. Sorry, were you just going to jump in, Professor? Um, you mean uh, yeah. which of us? So, uh, yeah, uh, go ahead. <laughs> which professor? There, <laughs> I yes. love having a hangout where everyone's so intelligent that when you call people doctor or professor, no one knows who you're talking to. Let's just get. I just want to get back to. Let's assume that that Jan's study is correct and that people are getting uh, getting dumber. If they are getting dumber, why? Oh my gosh! Well, I I I I, I hope. Or do you that not even want to concede? Do you, not, do you not even want to concede that point? What's your well, theory? I, I mean, what what do you what do you make of it? Do you think people are getting dumber in certain ways and smarter in other ways, or is there a is there a trend line in in one direction or the other? You're going to Jan on, on no, that, no no right? you, no no I'm I'm going to you, Professor Meyer. Okay, uh, I I genuinely don't know. I don't study intelligence over time. So I, I really can't say much about uh, about that area. You study intelligence uh, today quite a lot. Do you have a hunch? You must yes. have thought about it. About how, whether intelligence is changing over yeah. time, you mean? Yeah. Well, I th I'm, I'm more aware of how our conceptions of intelligence are changing over time and how we're broadening um, our conceptions of things like general intelligence, which maybe 50 or 70 years ago we thought was just verbal, well, 100 years ago we might have thought or identified with just verbal intelligence and maybe a little bit of speededness and a little bit of uh, uh, mechanical intelligence or putting together puzzles. But now we're really broadening our view of what intelligence consists of so that the problem solving that we're tracking down, uh, we discover is part of many, many different mental capacities a person has. So, for example, in personal intelligence, one of the things that we're working on right now in my laboratory, we're discovering that there's an ability to reason about people's personality traits. Uh, and uh, there's a kind of a logic of personality traits we can use. And if I just might go back for one moment to correct, uh, uh, I didn't want to leave a misimpression that emotional intelligence is scored with consensus solely. Uh, we've, we're now moving to this, what I refer to as veridical scoring, where we really do mark out the logic of a particular domain, and then we ask field uh, area experts to select the correct answer. So we're going beyond, uh, we're, we're, we're starting to score the tests as our traditional intelligence tests. Right, because we're learning more and more about how emotions work. Yes, I, I refer to the, my colleagues and I refer to the process as, as institutionalization of information. So when when uh, public education was introduced back in the uh, late 1700s and early 1800s and, and mid 1800s, um, well, psychology didn't exist then. So they institutionalized, understandably, they ins institutionalized understandings about words, about uh, arithmetic, geometry, things that uh, concerned the industrialization of the Western world. Um, as psychology emerged a century later so information such as how emotions work and the logic behind emotions or how personality works and the logic behind personality really hasn't it really is in the process of being institutionalized right now so we're now we're coming up with correct answers for the first time which in part make these tests that we developed from my, in my lab uh, on emotional and personal intelligence uh, that make them possible Jan, I'd be interested in your thoughts about the types of ways in which we're getting smarter and the types of ways in which we're getting dumber. I know that a lot of people often make the criticism of modern society that we have so many technological devices and we spend so much time on Twitter and Facebook and we're so constantly distracted by the 24-hour cable news cycle that our brains are sort of scattered and we might be good, we might be intellectually nimble, but we might not be as deep as we once were when we spent hours sitting in the corner reading Jane Austen. Uh, do you think that there are different types of intelligence that are getting better and other types that are getting worse? Oh, yes, yes. There was an interesting discussion on this on the, the Huffington Post Live uh, last week or some time ago. Eh? The conclusion was we are getting smarter and we are getting dumber. I thought it was a quite uh, summed it up quite nicely. So in, in the past, we had some skills and we don't use the skills anymore, so we uh, lose them. For instance, my, my grandfather was a farmer, so he had all the skills of working with horses. Well, that's, that's a skill only very specialized people have nowadays. And now we have skills of working with computers, of very, very quickly finding all kinds of little pieces of information on the internet. And so, or, or like, uh, I, I guess my generation was also the last one that was in uh, uh, mental arithmetic. And we, we still learned how to calculate things in our head. The present generation seems to have lost that skill. And also a thing I noticed with my undergraduate students at the University of Amsterdam, also the, the spelling skills have declined quite a lot. So, for instance, for my course, they have to hand in an assignment every week, and they have to write some five pages. And 
there's always a couple of students who hand in assignments with 100 to 150 language mistakes eh? without uh, without offering an apology an apology or giving a reason why when i was a student it was not done eh? if, if your supervisor pointed out that you made a mistake one mistake uh, you you felt very ashamed eh? so this has changed a lot i find that the the, the spelling skills of the students have declined quite a lot I wonder if that's a question of expectation setting rather than actual uh, talent. I mean, is it, is it just that they know that they can get away with it more than they used to? Could be as well. Could be as yeah. well. Uh, I want to read some comments that our viewers are leaving online. Emphatico says, in the past you actually had to learn how to multiply, for example, a three-digit number by another three-digit number or how to do linear programming. Nowadays there are gadgets that would do those things quite easily. No need to work your brain too hard anymore. Justice Holmes says, IQ really measures cognitive ability or capacity. A person could have a high IQ and be, in common parlance, stupid. A person with a high IQ could believe the Earth is 6,000 years old. Would that person be stupid, uneducated or delusional? Blue National says, aptitude has changed, but intelligence is still the same, Josh. Marissa Emily says, phones are getting smarter as people get dumber. Professor Meyer, what do you make of the, uh, the analogy of a person with a very high IQ who believes the world is 6,000 years old? Well, uh, such people do exist, and uh, it, it's, a, it, it's a reminder to us, uh, to any of us who study intelligence, that unfortunately a high in, uh, intelligence or, or one, any attribute of personality is not going to save our species that is to say if, you know if if uh, I, I if we can imagine a world where everybody were brilliant i'm not sure that would solve all, all of our problems um even if we imagine people with everybody possessing a good personality whatever that might be uh it's hard to imagine that that would solve uh, uh solve all of humanity's uh issues on the one hand on the other hand uh i do think that I, I do view intelligence as a as a net plus for most people, except if it's so enormously high that it makes it frustrating to live with other human beings, <laughs> which occasionally is the case. Do you think that there's a correlation there, that correlation that you're alluding to, that, uh, that perhaps a uh, high IQ or high conventional intelligence is correlated to lower emotional intelligence? Uh, in fact, we know that it is, it is the reverse. Uh, emotional intelligence rises with, uh, with other forms of intelligence. It's not a ter I wouldn't characterize it as a terribly strong relationship, but it is, uh, it is a clear relationship. So uh, I'm, sur I'm grasping for words as to how to describe the relationship. I don't think any will come. I'll just, I'll just say that it is a definite relationship, but not an enormously strong one. So that those of us who are in the middle spectrum, uh, in general, in uh, let's say verbal intelligence and emotional intelligence, uh, some of us may be better verbally than we are emotionally. Some of us may be better emotionally, that is reasoning about emotions, than we are reasoning about uh, words. Um, but on the whole, if we look over hundreds or thousands of people, we see that the two skills rise and fall together. One case that I've heard made is that... Something? Yeah, 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 I'll jump in. Yeah. Uh, there's also a brilliant study from the United States, a classical study, so the so-called Terman's termites. So Terman tested all the, the, the young children with IQs over 130, and he tried to follow them all his life. And so a, a very fascinating finding is that these all very brilliant people with a mean IQ of 152 also had very good social skills. So in the 1910 and 1920s, people thought that gifted children had very bad social skills, that they stayed at home and that they were shy. And actually, the opposite is happening. They have very good skills. So it's also very nice when uh, uh, high IQ children skip a few classes. And so then they're 12 and they, they uh, spend a lot of time with children from age 50. But they have the same, uh, let's say, uh, uh, social development. So it fits very well. Interesting. Uh, I've, I've heard a case made that uh, it's not actually very necessary for a large proportion of any given population to be intelligent because humans are such good copycats and that all you need are a few outliers. You know, once, if you have a, a, small, a, a large enough subset of Steve Jobses, then the rest of us get to use iPhones regardless of whether or not we're getting dumber. What do you make of that, Jan? Oh, oh absolutely. This has been studied. Huh? The, the, a, a very good predictor of economic progress is the people with an IQ of 100, above 140 in your society. As a Professor Heiner Rindemann from, uh, uh, from Germany has done a lot of research on that. So people often tend to forget how extremely influential high IQ people are in a society. And that's also why it's so bad that IQ of society has been going down uh, the last 120 years. But couldn't you, so, make the, couldn't you make the counterpoint? I mean, couldn't you make the, the case that as long as you still have that minority of people who are, who are the creative, inventive 
geniuses, it doesn't quite matter whether or not the overall IQ is going down amongst the rest of the population as long as people are very good at copying? Well, no, I, I think you underestimate the problem. So that's the thing we also show in our article. And so we look at spectacular scientific innovations and the, the amount of spe spectacular scientific innovations has uh, decreased dramatically for the last 150 years. So in 1872, we had six per year, we had six, 16 spectacular uh, scientific innovations. And nowadays we have only four. And so this could be a very strong indication that there's a decline in people with high IQ. So I think we really have to take this decline in reaction times uh, very seriously. Mm. Professor Maia, do you have thoughts about that? Well, uh, I'm, I'm just sitting here going, how do, you, uh, how do you evaluate a spectacular scientific innovation? Um, because I would think that uh, the working as a scientist today, I think things are very, very different than working in, uh, as a scientist uh, 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 100 or 200 years ago or 300 years ago, in that uh, because the field is saturated with scientists, often one makes a, an incremental step, a smaller step, and then another group, scientific group, comes and makes another incremental uh, step forward so that, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jan himself, his article appears along with, uh, as he mentioned, a dozen other articles about uh, uh, Flynn effects and changes of intelligence over time and so forth. Uh, so we're sharing uh, these innovations together. Uh, so I, I just have some question as to how you would evaluate what a major uh, breakthrough would be nowadays versus long ago. Yeah. Uh, what would you say that people ought to be doing or that we could be doing as a society to get the most out of our, our intellect to make us uh, yeah, as smart as possible? Uh, directing toward uh, yeah. uh, either us. Yeah. I, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I think that uh, one, of the, one of the intriguing things about this the, the research on showing people's effectiveness is that education, uh, skills, the opportunity to develop one's mental life uh, makes makes a huge difference in how people perform on intelligence tests to the extent that intelligence tests are valid, and I believe they are valid, they, they reveal problem-solving ability directly, uh, then education is a very, you know, it's, it's a painful, slow way forward, but it works. <laughs> Jan, if, as you say, we are dumber than we were in the Victorian era, how do we reverse that trend? Clearly, education is not the only solution because we're better educated than we were back then. Uh, that's a question I always get. Uh, it's, it's a very important question. Uh, my, my answer is always the same. I, I'm a scientist. I report effects. I do my best to report effects. So what you do with these findings, you know, that's a question of values. That's a thing, for instance, for politicians. Politicians have certain values and people with comparable values, they vote for these politicians. Or, uh, you know, it's the decision of the parents what to do with these outcomes. And so, you know, there's all kinds of solutions, but I'm not the one to tell them what to do. Uh, well, let me ask you the question then, not as a scientist, but as a, as a person, because I find it hard to believe that you don't ponder these things uh, as you fall asleep at night. Uh, as, a, as a parent or a, as, a, as an administrator, what would you do? Well, you know, there's all kinds of solutions which you could choose. Huh? Uh, uh, for instance, uh, I was looking at the movie, uh, uh, what was it, with, uh, Back to the Future the other day. <laughs> they have brain implants. Eh? You have the Biff character who's got brain implants, then they don't work for him. I guess he has cheap ones. Well, maybe we could develop brain, brain implants, uh, focus a lot of energy on that. So our brains would be running as fast as in Victorian times. And so there's also uh, experiments on animals of... Uh, playing with the chromosomes, of playing with the genes. So maybe we could uh, look at that research. But that it, it will be years and years before that will work. Uh, you know, this is just two solutions to the problem. I love the of idea. Of course, college, oh, sorry. Yeah, go for I, it, I, Professor Mayer. I was just going to say, of course, college students uh, have been uh, trying, uh, taking certain, you know, caffeinated beverages and, and uh, other, other, other drugs to try to enhance their cognition. Uh, as well, we know uh, uh, from studies across the United States. Uh, I'm not. I, I'm not I'm, the studies show that that may not be a good idea, but there is. Uh, that's another way that some yeah. people are taking things into their own hands. There certainly seems to be. A, it seems to be a short-term benefit of those uh, of misuse of drugs like Ritalin and Adderall, which I assume is what you're alluding to in terms of test score performance, right? 
Yes, although I'm not sure that they really do show in uh, latest studies or, or a recent study I showed uh, saw uh, really question whether they re, uh, whether they re, whether they uh, lead to an advantage. People feel as if there's an advantage, but whether they really uh, provide an advantage is a, is another question, and that's much less much uh, much more difficult to figure. Well, hopefully all this overuse of all of my technology and my social media feeds will not make me so stupid that I need to get a Biff implant, I think we'll call it, Jan, the, uh, the, the mental upgrade from Back to the Future. Thanks to both of you for being part of the conversation. It's really fascinating stuff. We'll keep an eye on it, of course. You can let us know what uh, you think about all this by leaving a comment in the comment well. You can find links to the original study in the resource well. This is HuffPost Live.